Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This time we're going to tackle chapter 7.1, Pythagorean triples. This is going to be a super easy lesson for you since you've been learning about the Pythagorean theorem since just about as long as you can remember doing math. Up on the screen, you'll see the question that I'm going to ask you in your exit form. If you didn't remember, the Pythagorean theorem states that if you have a right triangle, then the sum of the squares of the two legs is equal to the hypotenuse squared, or a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Now, you're in ninth grade HP geometry, so now we're going to ramp this up to the next level. We're going to talk about something called Pythagorean triples. You may have already noticed doing several Pythagorean theorem problems over the course of your math career that sometimes you get a nice whole number, and sometimes you get an ugly irrational, never-ending, never-repeating decimal. Well, we're going to do, tackle that problem in two ways. One, I'm going to require you to remember, recall, memorize sets of Pythagorean triples, and I'll, under, I'll explain to you what those are in just a moment. And secondly, we are going to express all our answers during this entire chapter in simplest radical form. So in other words, no decimals unless specifically stated by the problem. A Pythagorean triple is a set of three whole numbers that satisfy the Pythagorean theorem. That is, if you were to choose lengths of a particular set of three sides, uh, that the right triangle would be a true right triangle with those lengths of those sides. One of the most common one is a 3, 4, 5. That's used on like half of the Pythagorean theorem problems you'll ever experience, ever. Um, but there are certain other common ones that I want, your, want you to memorize. Up on the screen, you'll see the four sets of Pythagorean triples that I require you to memorize. Now, if you plug in each one of these sets of numbers into the Pythagorean theorem, remembering that the longest side will always go in, be substituted in for C, all four sets of these three numbers will satisfy it. That is, one side of the equation will be equal to the other side. These are the four most common, and these are the four that I'm going to require you to memorize. However, you should be aware that there are many more, and here's the next most common set of four, and in fact, the next smallest set of four uh, that are out there. It's an interesting fact to know that there are, in fact, an infinite number of Pythagorean triples, and here they are represented in kind of a visual way. Uh, well, obviously not all of them, because there's an infinite number of them, but here are many sets of Pythagorean triples. Now, you not only need to know what a Pythagorean triple is, but you also need to be able to use it. And you need to be able to use it like this. So let's say you got a triangle sitting in front of you, and it's a labeled as a right triangle, or you can somehow or another prove that it's a right triangle, and it has two sides labeled 3 and 5. Well, if you're smart enough to just memorize the Pythagorean triple, you should notice that the 5 is placed on the hypotenuse, so that's awesome because it's the longest side. And then the one side that's missing is the 4 of the 3, 4, 5 Pythagorean triple. So you know just by instinct, without having to do the Pythagorean theorem, that the missing side length is 4. Now here's where it gets slightly more complicated, is that not only are Pythagorean triples, they satisfy the Pythagorean theorem, but so do their multiples. So if I take a 3, 4, 5 triangle, and I say multiply it by 2, or make it twice as big, well, the 6, 8, 10 triangle, the 6, 8, 10 is also a Pythagorean triple. That is that it will, again, satisfy the Pythagorean theorem. So you can take any multiple of any of these Pythagorean triples, and it will also satisfy the Pythagorean theorem. Case in point, here's a giant pink triangle. Try to figure out what the missing side is. This is, again, another 3, 4, 5 right triangle, but this time I chose to multiply by some obscure uh, 
fact scale factor basically we scaled it up by a factor of 11.1 .1. and if you take 11.1 .1 times each one of those numbers in the Pythagorean triple you'll get 55.5 being the missing link and as I explained at the beginning of this video I said that we're going to take what we know about the Pythagorean theorem and just kind of amplify it a little bit we're going to put all our answers in simplest radical form and the issue with that is that we need to be very comfortable with manipulating numbers that have square roots associated with them. If you're comfortable with that, you probably don't need to watch the rest of this video, but I have a problem here that is going to force me to deal with square roots in ways that some of us are uncomfortable. And it's kind of a cool problem. It's kind of a classic. It simply states you have a 10 by 10 by 10 cube, and I would like to know the longest stick that can fit inside of it from corner to corner, that is from diagonal to diagonal. And the way this is done is we're actually going to do Pythagorean theorem twice. Okay, so you notice that this triangle, this right triangle that X is a part of, this hypotenuse, is not set up because we don't know either of the legs. So we have to do another Pythagorean theorem problem to figure out this hypotenuse of these, this smaller right triangle. If you were to extract that triangle, it would look like that. Uh, I chose red here, and that's what the triangle would be. So you simply set up the Pythagorean theorem for that, find out what C is, and then use C as one of your legs to figure out what X is. And if you took out that triangle that contains X, it would look a little something like this. You'd have C on one leg, you'd have 10 on the other, and our unknown hypotenuse would be X. So the first step is to find C. The second step is to find X. And the procedure is going to be very familiar to you. We just have to worry about dealing with square roots. So uh, start with the red triangle, set up Pythagorean theorem. So 10 squared plus 10 squared equals C squared. And if you do that, you get 100 plus 100, which is 200. Now, here's where things get slightly more complicated, and you might remember this from earlier in the year. You take a square root of both sides. Once you do that, you want to simplify into simplest radical form, which means that you want to split this 200 up into perfect square factors. So if you don't have the perfect squares memorized from 1 to 15, and maybe even 1 to 20, I would highly recommend doing that. So you want to find perfect square factors of whatever number you're trying to simplify. In this case, 100 times 2 equals 200. So now I can split this square root up over this multiplication. Remember, you can't split a square root up over addition, but you can split up square root up over multiplication. And I can take the square root of 100 and not take the square root of 2 separately. And your final simplified answer for C would be 10 times the square root of 2. So now we know what C is. We can take this 10 times the square root of 2 and plug it into this smaller right triangle, or actually larger right triangle, the green right triangle, and set up another Pythagorean theorem. Now, doing this, you have to keep in mind that Pythagorean theorem takes whatever your legs are, even if they're multiple terms, and squares it. So in other words, you have a set of parentheses here that complicates things. That says take the entire quantity 10 times the square root of 2 and square it, and then add it to 10 squared. You also need to be able to distribute a power onto a product. And a one of our properties of powers says that if you have something that's multiplied together inside the parentheses, you can distribute that power. So distribute that square onto the 10 and the square root of 2, meaning that you would get 100 and the square root of 2 times the square root of 2. Now, if you take the square root of 2 times itself, you just get 2 back again. Okay, so you get 100 times the square root of 2, and then, of course, 10 squared is 100. From there, simplify, you get down to 300. Take a square root of both sides. And this is, again, another situation where you have to try to find perfect square factors of 300. And just like 200, 300 can be split up into a perfect square factor of 103. So we're going to split that up into 103, take the square root of each separately, and you get 10 times the square root of 3 is the length of x. 
Now, just to drive the point home and work with square roots a little bit more, I'm going to ask a second question, which is what is the area of the green triangle? Which means that you have to remember what the area formula is for a triangle, and you have to work with square roots a little bit more. So let's take a closer look at that green triangle. If you label it up with all the information that we found previously, uh, one of its legs is 10 times the square root of 2, the hypotenuse is 10 times the square root of 3, and the side of it, the other leg, is just plain old 10. Now, what is the area of a triangle? 1 half base times height, or base times height divided by 2. Which of these numbers will we use? So the base of a triangle is kind of whatever you choose it to be, but it's going to be how wide the triangle is. So typically we think that from left to right. So let's say 10 times the square root of 2 in this case. And the height is the only tricky part. Just remember that the height of a triangle is literally how tall it is. So it is an altitude. We spent chapter 6 drawing altitudes. Uh, so you should be well familiar with what an altitude is. So the height of a triangle is not necessarily contained within the triangle, or an altitude is not contained necessarily within a triangle. So keep that in mind. Substitute everything in. You get 1 half times 10 times the square root of 2 times 10. And the question is, what can you combine, can you combine, and what can you not? So Basically, the rule here is that you can combine anything that's outside of a square root with each other, and you keep everything inside of a root separate. So in this case, we can combine the 1 half, the 10, and the 10, getting us 50, and the square root of 2 will be all by itself. And that's our final answer for that one. Uh, if you want to get a head start on the homework, I'll have copies for you in class tomorrow, but the worksheet. There is a blank copy of the worksheet on my website. I'll see you next time.